We all saw what was going on in that House chamber this week. You know, the the comparison between what the Democrats were trying to do, which was, number one, get Hunter Biden to be able to testify publicly so everybody could hear it. I mean, like, why cherry pick stuff? But number two, showing that the hypocrisy of the GOP is alive and well in D.C. I mean, I don't know. How did you navigate that particular hearing? Because you're a lawyer, you're a member of Congress, and so you know what facts, evidence and the law actually were. And I'm a representative. And so the, the first thing I did was take a step back and think, like, well, what do the people uh, I represent care about? It, it's certainly not Republicans acting as Donald Trump's lawyer, you know, as the largest law firm in Washington, D.C., working for just one client. They want breathing room in their finances. They want their health care costs to come down. They want their kids to be safe at school from gun violence. And, and these guys, they're just an echo for Donald Trump. There, there's nothing that they do uh, that works to benefit anyone who's in need. And, and then I think about Donald Trump, and, and you listen to the grievances and what you played in the opening. It's just me, me, me. And I think what President Biden has to do is make it clear as we go to the next 10 months into November that this election for him is going to be about you and what you need in your life. So, you know, Congressman, at the beginning of your segment, we were talking about how You've got the judicial system, right? And you've got judges that are going to gatekeep, and you've got juries that are going to sit there and make determinations because that's how our judicial system works. But then Donald Trump decides that it's not going to work for him in court, so he wants to go out, he wants to play the media, right? Or he wants to dispatch his House Republicans to be able to do his dirty deeds for him. We've seen him lose in court. He just got tagged with $400,000 or so of attorney's fees. We're seeing him getting tagged with damages. E. Jean Carroll's got her second defamation trial that's coming up next week. But why can't those things move in parallel, right? Why can't justice happen in a courtroom, justice happen in Congress, and justice happen in the court of public opinion? Well, I'd say justice is happening in the courtroom. And, and by the way, Katie, you've practiced uh, law in a courtroom, and you know that Donald Trump is not being treated worse than any criminal defendant. He is being treated actually better. In fact, most defendants would be in custody uh, and have their bail revoked if they acted the way that Donald Trump uh, has acted. But what we're seeing, I, I believe, and we've been so frustrated and impatient that justice would never come for Donald Trump, that in the last year, this tapestry of accountability has been stitched together from the criminal cases to the civil cases. And it, I think, creates kind of this security blanket for our rule of law and, and for our democracy. And so if we can keep the faith in our rule of law and do what we've done since Donald Trump was elected in November 2016, which is mobilize and organize and show that through voting, not violence, what they would use, uh, that, you know, we can uh, restore justice in this country. That's how we do it. And as somebody who participated in one of the two impeachment trials of Donald Trump, I'm sure it takes a moment for you sometimes to have to think about how things could have been different, right? How things could have been so different for the United States, especially as we see the judicial system being used through Section 3 of the 14th Amendment to be able to try to get Donald Trump disqualified, if not already, in some jurisdictions. Your thoughts about the fact, though, that there are some familiar faces that have been around through those impeachment trials of Donald Trump. They're still there in the halls of Congress, and they're still doing the dirty work for Donald Trump. We came so close with impeachment, with Republicans joining us, and we could have kept him from running again. Uh, of course, there's these cases out there uh, that may keep him off the ballot. But you know what? I think the, the sweetest victory, uh, the redemption for our democracy is going to be uh, when the American people, particularly in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Nevada, Georgia, and Arizona, show up and beat him at the ballot box. Uh, and that's where we're going to bury uh, MAGAism is that voters are going to show that we're not going away. We're not going to be intimidated. Uh, that on all the freedoms we care about, uh, we're going to show up and fight for them. And, and that they are a party that would rather rule than govern. They prefer violence rather than voting. And when it comes to any issue that matters, like the border or crime uh, or health care costs, they don't want the fix. They want the fiction. And if we're a party that wants to get things done, I feel very good about where this is going. So it's funny you use the word Congressman fiction because that's exactly what we've been talking about, which are the alternative facts. Donald Trump's alternative facts, the alternative facts of House Republicans, things that are not actually doing anything that's good for Americans at large. 
We are on the cusp of November 2024. It sounds like it's far away, but it's really not, as you and I both know. How does it work then, do you think, that the judicial system can actually be a stopgap to the demise of democracy before we actually are looking at things at the ballot box in November? Well, well first, again, we, we can't control the pace of the judicial system. And, and so what we can control, as I said, is what we do with the agency we have uh, as voters who hold Donald Trump accountable at the ballot box. And again, I, I think what you're going to find here is that, uh, you know, the redemption will be that whatever happens to Donald Trump uh, in the criminal trials or the civil trials, it will be because a jury of his peers made the decision. And so he won't get Trump justice, which is what he would meet out against any of his opponents. He will get American justice. And then we have to do our own sense of justice, as I said, when we go to the ballot box. And that's how we renew and write a new chapter for America in November. I don't envy you to have to live Groundhog Day over and over again. What is that saying? You know, insanity, right, is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Frustratingly, that is the GOP House Republicans that you have to deal with. But you're the expert. You're on the budget committee. Tell us some good news that we're not going to have a government shutdown. Well, here's the good news, is that you've got some adults in the room. Uh, the Democrats have shown over the last year that every single time we come to the brink of an emergency, uh, we are able to get our act together and make sure that we uh, avoid a default, avoid a shutdown. I, I, I expect that we will be the heroes once again, because these are not serious people. The fact that Chip Roy would even, you know, float the idea of once again, trying to vacate the chair of the speaker's office. It's delusional. They don't have leadership there that can bring their conference together. And the fact that we were renegotiating the top line that we, as you said, it's Groundhog's Day. We already negotiated that top line back in June. And so it's so clear to me that we have to be so focused on flipping the House in 2024 because these uh Republicans have shown that they don't actually know how to do this work. They don't know how to govern. And you spoke to an issue that uh, I find very infuriating, that the continuing to go after the IRS, uh, their ability to go after tax cheats. I mean, let's think about this. What do Americans care about the most? They care about their freedoms, their rights, and fairness. Those are the things that they care about. Is it fair to allow wealthy tax cheats to get away with not paying their fair share? Absolutely not. People know this. This is this is not something that we should have on the table at all in this deal. But you say people know this. Some people may know that that you talk about. But do the American people know this? Because we've had this conversation, you and I, at different times. You've had this conversation with other people at different times. Do the American people understand that? The House Republicans, instead of focusing on the fact that they keep on putting Band-Aids and Band-Aids on hemorrhaging wounds, that they're instead doing stuff like what I've called impeachment palooza. It's like, who can we impeach next? It's Mayorkas. Who can we impeach next? Let's go after Lloyd Austin. Do the American public, can they hear you? Are they hearing the Democrats? Are they seeing that it's Democrats are that, quote, adults in the room? Well, they certainly see the contrast because they know that it's been chaos for an entire year. Uh, you know, in terms of the IRS issue, I think what we need to get better about is translating to Americans directly how that impacts them. So when you look at the tax code, for example, um, if you are a wealthy American, you already have so many advantages. And yet here we are, 1% of the richest, uh, you know, the wealthiest people in this country have been able to recapture two thirds of the additional wealth since the pandemic. So there is a, a clear distinction to be made between the haves and the have nots here. And there is no story that the Republicans tell can tell about their successes. Even Chip Roy, in his famous speech on the House back in December, said, show me one thing, one thing. He's talking to his own college. Show me one thing that we can say to the American people that we got done. So the fact that he is even once again, you know, floating the idea of bringing his conference back into chaos, it, it tells me that this this conference is bankrupt at this point. Well, what's not bankrupt is the idea that in 2024, you got all the House Republicans probably talking about tax cuts, right, for the rich. I, I wanted to ask you one quick question before I had to let you go. Moderate Dems, are they willing to support Mike Johnson? 
if that motion to vacate comes up that Chip Roy just threatened? I think they are. Uh, I certainly have uh, many friends who are in uh, would consider themselves uh, in in districts that are uh, frontline districts, and they have said they're not interested in having three more weeks or more of chaos. Why the Republicans, you know, struggle and scramble to try to get themselves back together? We just don't have that kind of time. The American people want us to do some work, and you didn't mention it, but I have to mention it because this has been the least productive. Congress in recent history, in almost 100 years. And we're on track to be the least productive ever that this country has seen. And that is because the Republicans, even with their slim majority, were not able to deliver. When Speaker Pelosi had a slim majority, we got the Inflation Reduction Act. We got the infrastructure bill. We have so many things that delivered for actual uh, Americans that they care about, like reducing the price of insulin, what do the Republicans have to show from this year? Just fight after fight after fight. And as you pointed out, making it easy for the wealthy to cheat on their taxes. That's something that that's something to campaign on. I think you short. I think you're short changing. I think they, they passed um, post office names. I think they, they actually managed to do that. Never I love the woman. post office, but the naming part not as important. Perhaps. How about funding the post office so people can actually get their mail? No, thanks to the Republicans. That doesn't happen. Congresswoman Becca Ballin, thanks for being here. Ahead of the 2024 presidential election, voters have made it clear in numerous polls that threats to our democracy are the most important issues facing the country. An insurrection, menacing election workers and local officials, and attacks on voting rights are shaking people's confidence. But despite all of that, there are good stories. Many young Americans are motivated to participate in the elections process and are creating pathways to expand voting rights and participation in government. And on Wednesday night, 16 and 17 year olds in Newark, New Jersey, won the right to vote in local school board elections after the city council unanimously passed an ordinance that would allow them to vote starting in April. It's the first statewide initiative of its kind. And as The New York Times reports, it makes Newark the largest community to expand voting rights to younger residents since the 26th Amendment lowered the voting age to 18 in 1971. Immediately, this historic move will give students of Newark more say over what happens in their schools and in their lives. Joining us now are two of those students, 16-year-old Nate Esubante and Brianna Campbell, who helped push the Newark City Council to lower the voting age. And they're joined by Ryan Haygood, president of the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice, one of the main organizations that backed this effort. First and foremost, my congratulations to all of you, but I definitely want to speak to you, Nate, and to you, Brianna. Talk about, Nate, first, why it was so important to make sure that you had a say in what happens in your own life. Um, I, I believe it's very important for us to have a say in our life because, personally, I believe that since we're in school for one third of the day, we're, we should have a way to speak about issues that occur. So, with this, um, with this being, being processed, it would vote for it'd be able, we would be able to vote for candidates that keep us safe because I believe that um, a pressing issue is gun reforms, and having us being able to put in a vote, we would be able to put in a vote for a candidate that can keep us safe. Brianna, talk about the response from your fellow students and from other teenagers in the community. I mean, you know, I like to say that my girl who's nine is going on 30, that they're just not the same like when we were growing up. And it's true, though, because the issues that you all face at your age are totally different than what we did. Do you feel like now everybody is going to vote because they have the right to vote at the age of 16? Kids my age were very, honestly, very excited because not only do they have the voice, they also have the vote, vote to make decisions that impact us. Me personally, I am very excited in organizing my peers and 7,000 students who can now vote to address issues that I deeply care about, which is equity and quality education and educational equity. Nate, did you feel like there was a void there? Do you feel like you were talking and sharing what was important to you and your classmates and to your fellow students, but that the adults, well, you guys are adults, frankly, but that there were people over the age of 18 that weren't listening to you? 
Um, I believe when I presented it in my the school, because in today we had like a class in history and we were like the topic, our teacher was very, very happy that us students were able to have a say in what happens in school. And then it, it just gives us the empowerment that we have a say. Ryan, I wanted to ask you, you have created what looks like to be a successful template to be able to do this in yeah. other states. I know that other states and other jurisdictions are asking you for help. Talk about mm -hmm. whether or not this can be replicated with success in other places. Yeah, Katie, so first of all, thanks for having on this show. We've thought a lot about this to the your first point about this being really the next frontier for the expansion of voting rights, that is lowering the voting age to 16-year-olds in elections that matter most to them. So New Jersey's constitution gives cities the express authority to lower the voting age, as Newark has taken the lead in doing. But there are other states across the country that have similar constitutions. I think, in the top of my mind, our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., is similar to New Jersey's constitution. And I just want to say really quickly, one of the very powerful things that came from the hearing when the city council unanimously lowered the voting age of 16 for school board elections was in Nate's testimony. Nate testified that there are, in the city of Newark, in the last school board election, turnout, Katie, was 3 percent. One, two, three percent. And Nate said, because turnout is so low, young people can't rely on other people to make decisions for them that they are to be empowered to make decisions themselves. And that's really what this move is about. This move, lowering the voting age in Newark to 16, empowers, to Brianna's point, 7,000 young people, 16 and 17-year-olds, to vote in the elections that matter most to them. 90% of those young people are black and brown. So we're very excited about what this expansion of voting rights means for empowering young people to have access to the fundamental right that is preservative as the Supreme Court says, of all other fundamental rights. Last question I have is going to go to Brianna. Brianna, I heard you talk about the issues that are important to you. There are kind of global issues, but you talked about racial equality, right? You talked about social justice. Do you feel like those very weighty, very important issues are kind of a common denominator, considering the fact that, as we just heard from Ryan, you've got almost 90 percent of the kids or the young people that are now going to be able to vote are actually of people of color? I would say yes. Um, and it quality does play a role in this because it gives everybody the chance to advocate for what they believe is right and what is wrong. So being able to sit here and talk to you inspires other teams, minority groups, to come out and talk about what they feel is important. Well, I just wanted to say they have that phrase, right? The kids are all right. You guys are not kids. You guys are young adults that are making a difference, inspiring yeah. Nate Esubantang, Brianna Campbell, and Ryan Haygood. My yeah. hat off to you, Ryan, for, yeah. for taking the time to devote to yeah. be able to make sure that this happens. Congratulations to all of you again. Thank, Thank you for having us.